so welcome everyone, those of you who are able to, to join and those of you who might be watching this recording later on. My name is Rochelle Savoy. This is my fifth year at ASD. Um, my first two years, I was a high school social studies teacher. And the last three years, I've been in a role um, of an instructional coach, which is where I partner with teachers to reflect on their practice. Um, I support them in, in implementing different instructional strategies. And feedback is a topic that comes up a lot um, and that I discuss a lot with teachers. So I thought it would be a useful topic to share with parents as well. So our main outcomes or objectives for our time together today is to just generally think about or talk about what feedback is, what it isn't, um, what makes feedback effective, consider how we actually deliver the feedback so it's more impactful, and then finally um, I'll briefly touch on how we can learn to receive feedback with a growth mindset and how we can empower our children to develop this growth mindset to feedback. To ground us in our topic today, um, I do want to invite you to take a minute to reflect on the question, what is the best piece of feedback you've received? Might be hard to, to think of, but think about a, a piece of feedback, good or bad, but it was effective, and why was it? And I'll just give a minute of think time. It could be something from this morning. It could be something from 10 years ago. What's a piece of feedback you've received? And if you share that in the chat, and I'm needing to figure out how to access the chat, there it is. And if you're really struggling, maybe later on in the presentation, you might think of something because I'll share quite a few examples. Okay, so participant talked about um, it being actually a conversation and how, this, how it was styled and, and the message. Okay, so we're actually inundated with feedback all day long. Um, we're constantly told what we should and shouldn't do. So if you're driving a car on the road, this happens a lot in Dubai, you get honked at, that's feedback that's meant to correct us. Um, and I'm gonna use my son quite a few times in this presentation as an example. So he's just 22 months. Oh, but I feel like I give him feedback all day long. Don't grab the cat's tail. He'll scratch you. Don't dump your milk all over the counter. It'll make a mess. Our students get feedback all day long in the classroom, right? Don't talk to your classmate when the teacher's talking. Um, you got that math question correct. You got it wrong. You got that prediction correct or wrong in that science experiment, so on and so forth. And so although the above examples are information about our behaviors and they are meant to help us, is this feedback actually doing what it said, what the intention is behind it? And so I'm gonna just briefly share about what feedback isn't. And it's important to differentiate that. And so the first thing I'm gonna talk about is praise. Praise feels good, there's, it's important that there's a time and place for it, but it doesn't do anything to help us grow and learn. And praise can actually have negative effects on individuals. Research has shown that kids will become less willing to work on challenging problems if they're continually told they're smart. Another thing that's not constituted as feedback is advice. Advice is presented as an option. It's often referencing something that's happened in the past, so we can't necessarily do about it anything anyway. And we often get defensive when we're given advice, especially when that advice is given to us unsolicited, that we didn't actually ask for it. And finally, feedback isn't evaluation. Evaluation is a judgment of where someone is in relation to others or a particular goal. Evaluation can be useful information, and I'll talk about evaluation later on, but it doesn't qualify as feedback. And so there is a very generic definition of feedback from Merriam-Webster, but I'm gonna focus on a more holistic, inclusive definition from John Hattie. And he's an educational researcher who's done a lot of work in this area. And he defines feedback as useful information about the effects of an action in light of a goal. 
Okay, so someone needs to know where they're going um, in order for it to be feedback. And it reduces the gap between what learners currently understand and what they need to understand. And so I'm gonna bring back my example of my son and his constant pulling of the cat's tail. He knows he shouldn't, I think he knows that because we're constantly telling him he shouldn't, but what should he do instead? And I need to actually think about what's his goal. His goal is actually to play with the cat. He wants to be friends with the cat. And so we've shifted our language lately to say, use your gentle hands with Jinju, our cat's name. He'll play with you if, you, if you're gentle with him. And so we're referencing the goal he has and what behavior he needs to do in order to meet his goal. So that's our definition of what feedback is, but it's actually a lot harder to make it effective. And so for feedback to actually do what it's meant to do, there are a few elements that have to be in place. And I'm gonna share three of them. There are a few, but I, I find that these are the ones that can be most impactful. And so first of all, the feedback needs to be timely. This is why like assessments and tests aren't really feedback. They just provide information about if you met or didn't meet the goal, which is evaluation. Again, that's important information, but that's not feedback. And so teachers give feedback all day long at the practice phase. And we've really shifted in education to think about a formative versus summative. Formative assessments help students practice something, um, a new skill prior to an assessment where the stakes are a little bit higher. Again, back to my son's cattail pulling issue. If I had said, use your gentle hands, even five minutes after the interaction, it's no longer relevant. It's, it's not impactful to the situation anymore. The second um, element of effective feedback is be specific. Oops. Um, there's a limit to how much we can absorb and operationalize in any given time. If there's too much information or if it's too vague, it's confusing, it's overwhelming. We don't know where to start and we'll likely shut down or not take, a, it won't be effective at all. And so if you're told to focus on just one thing, we're more likely to understand it and act on it. There's a lot of things that I could tell my son to do that could um, make the cat more likely to play with him, such as don't scream and chase him around the house, don't try and hug him, um, but I'm focusing on the one that will hopefully make sense to him and yield the best results. And although I already mentioned that praise isn't feedback, I do want to address praise again in this element of feedback, um, because when praise is specific, it can actually be effective for learning. And so praise typically is good job, you worked hard on that, um, you know, great work, but that's not really useful. It's a little too vague. But if you start shifting praise to be specific, then that can be more effective. So here's an example. I appreciated your effort in trying many new math problems. At specific, the student knows what they did to be successful and they know what to continue to do to see more success. And the final element of effective feedback is that it focuses on the future. When we hear about flaws that we can't fix anymore because they're in the past and we can't change the past, it creates a feeling of helplessness, a belief that I might always get that wrong or I'll always do that wrong, what's the point? And in the book, The Feedback Fix, which I'll reference a few times this morning, it, the author suggests thinking of feedback as feed forward. What would be helpful in the future? then that becomes more about motivation. How do I get better the next time I'm in that situation? So instead of, here's an example that they give from the book. So let's say your son or daughter um, always is forgetting the materials for school and, and likely that might be impacting their performance in class. So instead of saying, oh, you need to remember your materials or you know, you're, you're gonna really fall behind if you always forget your laptop or your notebook, et cetera, make a plan for the future. Think about what are strategies you could apply to remember your materials, come up with a plan. Maybe it's a checklist before you leave the house uh, on a whiteboard out the door, or, um, and then also brainstorm, what do you do if you still forget? What are some solutions? Is there a friend you can ask? Is, does the teacher have some extra materials? You know, really thinking about how the student can be successful the next time they're in that situation is more likely to be effective than focusing on what they did in the past. Okay, so I've really, I mean, quickly, briefly talked about what feedback is, what it isn't, what makes it effective and more impactful. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time of delivering feedback. And I'm gonna use this reference of think like a coach. So when we deliver feedback that's aimed as coaching, 
we're really trying to help someone learn, grow, or change. Coaching feedback is often considered a facilitative approach to learning. So again, um, in the feedback fix, there's a study highlighted that shows that regular feedback doesn't typically result in a transfer of new skills or habits. But when that feedback is combined with coaching, that transfer skyrockets to 95%. So what does that look like? Um, and so likely when you're providing feedback at home, and again, there's feedback in the classroom and students get that all day long, it's gonna look a little different at home. And it's probably about something they're practicing or it might be the process of learning, um, the process of learning. And so it's effective to pose questions to help make sense of the feedback. Have them reflect on their learning process, helps them develop metacognition. So they're more aware of why and how they learn and how they can relearn that. And so again, let's, what does this look like in context? So maybe you're doing some math problems at home and you notice that your child gets the question wrong. You might ask them the question, well, I got a different answer. How did you get yours? Have them talk through the process that they went through to get to that response. Chances are talking through it, they might identify the error that they took. Pose the question, you know, and this can, this question can be in any context, not just math um, as a, that we typically reference, but how do you know that answer? Is it reasonable? Could there be another way of exploring this answer? And so again, when we're having students reflect on their learning, um, they become more metacognitive, more aware of their, of their learning. So the goal of feedback beyond the classroom, as I referenced, might not be to really get your child to understand what's right or wrong about a content or, or a subject that, that has a place at home, um, but it could also be a time to coach your child with their ability to work independently and to experiment with different learning, learning strategies when the stakes are low. So for example, you may set some goals together um, to think about if, if your child is reading and they get stuck on a word, maybe brainstorm strategies in which they can check their understanding. So, you know, and you could get them to think about some ways, you can offer some suggestions, you could try sounding it out, decoding, you can talk through what the context of the book is to get to see what would make sense, um, have them reread the sentence, but have them generate these lists of strategies in what will be most helpful for them when they get stuck. Feedback at home could also support students in understanding how they learn best. And so, Again, really using this facilitative process, pose questions to explore how they best learn. And so you could ask questions like, when do you feel more energized or motivated to complete work? And on weekends, maybe you could experiment, say, let's wake up first thing, do our whatever needs to be done that weekend and see how they feel and, and talk about that experience. And then maybe the next weekend you try in the afternoon after they've had some fun playing with friends. And so really this is an opportunity to try things out when, when the stakes are low. Other things to con consider, you know, do I learn best with music? Do I learn best when I'm standing, sitting at a desk, on the floor, on a beanbag chair? And so again, at home, this feedback experience could really look like, who am I as a learner? How do I best learn? What environment do I thrive in? One thing to remember is that we see and what we see or think is right is interpreted based on our own experiences, our own preferences, our own priorities. So, you know, the music example, my husband can be very concentrated and focused when there's music in the background. Me, if I really need to focus on something, I, I can't have any outside noise or outside distractions. And so I encourage you to share stories and to model this ability to reflect on your own experiences and understand what you do and why you do it um, and how it works. So your child can hear many different approaches and strategies, and it may not be that that will be useful. It won't, that strategy that's useful for you is useful for them, but the sharing and this modeling of this thinking then becomes a conversation with your child and an inquiry into who you each are and what's unique to you and what might be the same. I'm not able to see if there's questions, so I'm just going to Keep going here. Okay, so we've just talked about delivering feedback in a facilitative approach. And now I'm just gonna spend a little bit of time about receiving feedback. So not only 
how we learn is very distinct to who we are, we all receive feedback differently. And I'll reference some research a little bit, but regardless of how and who we are and how we're wired, there are two conditions that are important to make feedback even more impactful when we, when we are receiving it. We need to have a sense of trust. We are more likely to receive feedback positively from people we trust and we gain trust when we know people's motivation or their purpose in delivering that feedback. It, it, it's really genuine. And this is where I think it's interesting, the role of parent and teacher, right? The teacher gives feedback to the child. The child's pretty clear on their role. Um, and sometimes the parent role can be a little bit more gray or you know, they might think that you're trying to change them or do what worked for you. And so when you really kind of develop that trust for feedback, you know, there's trust obviously in the parent-child relationship, but that trust for delivering feedback, think about what's your purpose in this? How, how can you deliver this genuinely? A second um, condition that's really important is that we need to feel safe. If we're under stress, we are unlikely to understand or be open to any feedback. And so back to my son, I think this is a good example. When he is having a meltdown because the cat ran away and, and won't play with him, he, it, that's not the time for me to say, oh, I told you so, you needed to use your gentle hands. It needs to, um, that feedback will be received more likely when there is a moment where everything is calm, he feels safe, and, and he trusts that we actually want to develop this bond between him and our cat. Okay. Another way to empower students is to really think about how our brains are wired differently and think about how we react to feedback. And so some of us are very quick to recover from negative feedback. We hear something and we say, yeah, you know, I, get, I can see where that feedback was coming from. Some of us might actually say, meh, I don't really care. Some of us might actually think, oh, that feedback means that that one piece of feedback on that one assignment means that I'm a terrible student. I'm never gonna get into Yale or, or Harvard or you know, whatever it is. Um, and so we receive that differently. Um, and so, really kind of developing with your, your child a self-awareness. Ask them some questions. When I receive negative feedback, do I want to run? Do I want to fight? Do I want to deny that feedback? Do I want to exaggerate that feedback? And, and have them really reflect on that, that feeling that they're having um, as they're receiving that feedback. And so just like emotions, if we name our reaction, we're likely to tame our next reaction and more likely to retrain our brain to receive feedback more effectively the next time we receive something. And so again, questions that, that, that can help really empower a student to be, or a child to be self-aware. And this, this self-awareness is really impactful when you can really understand what story am I actually telling myself? Am I telling myself that I'm this student that is gonna you know, have a lot of struggles or am I just saying, okay, at this moment, at this time, I really struggled with this task. And I do realize that I am kind of going quite quickly through this, but this is sort of the, the final area I wanted to share in terms of empowering your child through feedback. And this is this idea of developing, supporting the development of a growth mindset. So growth mindset might be a familiar term, um, but if not, it's the belief that one's skills and qualities could be cultivated through effort and perseverance. And on, on the flip side, a negative mind or a fixed mindset is the belief that one's abilities are carved in stone and predetermined at birth. So there's actually been quite a lot of fascinating research in this area. And I do just need to um, X my slide for a second here. Um, I apologize, but I, there's some interesting research I wanna share. Okay. So studies have shown that students that um, have a growth mindset or de demonstrate a growth mindset, they perform better than students with a fixed mindset, significantly outscoring them in the areas of math and literacy. They're more likely to recognize the importance of effort in academic success. They are more likely to seek out more challenging academic tasks to enhance learning. They're more likely to value critical feedback. And I referenced this research earlier, but kids that are praised for effort 
as opposed to their intelligence, are more likely to are, are we're more likely to complete 50% more hard math problems than kids praised for intelligence. Let me just repeat that. Kids praised for effort complete 50% more hard math problems than kids praised for just intelligence. Growth mindset students are more likely to be open to being wrong and seeking out accurate information in order to adjust and learn. And so there was a study done where students read an article at the beginning of a semester about the benefits of admitting what we don't know rather than being certain about it. Their odds, the students that read this article, the odds of seeking extra help in an area of weakness spiked from 65 to 85%. And the, those students that read that article had higher, and I think this was in a, in a math um, course, were much higher than students that did not read that article. So growth-minded people believe in themselves and their abilities may not have the tools yet. So I'm just going to share here. I will um, re make that big. Okay. And so a growth minded person might say feedback is helpful. And really to help support our students in developing a growth mindset, it's really just a shift in language um, and a shift in, in what we say. So you might say at the dinner table, what was feedback you received that was helpful today? Reflect on their day through their feedback experiences and then have that dialogue and think about what was helpful about that. And if they can't think of something, you know, what could be helpful? There's some really great language on, on this visual here is that a growth-minded individual sees something that's difficult as a lesson, or they see, instead of seeing it as criticism, they see it as feedback, something that might be too hard as worthwhile. Another thing that a growth mindset doesn't a growth mindset individual does is thinks about the yet. So it's not like I will never get that. I don't understand that yet. And so something that you could say in response to, to your child, if they do get something wrong, it's that's not right. You don't understand this yet. What strategies can you try and understand it better? And this is where you bring in that facilitative feedback coaching approach. And so brainstorm together how next time you can find the tools that you have. And so um, I wanted to share a resource that I have found really helpful in helping really shift that language because you know, we're, we're in a culture and we do often hear words that do promote more of a fixed mindset than a support in, that support a growth mindset. And so I've been finding this resource interesting um, to support the shifting of language that I'm using. And so I'll share this in the chat um, somehow. Here we go. If that is of use to anyone in this session. At the end, I'm also going to share um, some, some books and some things that I've referenced as well. So in closing, I would like to ask for some feedback from, from you. What is something new you are thinking? Or what is something that has challenged how you thought before, um, but maybe are thinking slightly differently about that? Or maybe you still feel challenged by it, but you might want to explore it. You know, why, why am I reacting or why am I thinking that that's not sitting well with me? Or what is something that you might apply today with your interactions with your child? Is there some facilitative coaching questions that you might be able to ask? You may you think about how you might empower your child to think about developing more self-awareness and how they receive feedback. Um, is it shifting some language uh, to be more growth-minded? What is something that you might be able to apply? And so this is a way for me to get feedback on what was hopefully some takeaways for, for you as participants. So if you want to share that in the chat, and I do have a, a closing slide, but I'll, I'll wait till I get some feedback from you. Because we started a little bit late and I know I went through that fairly quickly. If there was anything, questions that people had um, or anything that you wanted me to revisit. Yeah, that, that feed forward, that really has challenged my thinking. And, and I started to, to think about that when I was in the classroom as well as, you know, a student would get some 
information that they couldn't apply right away. Um, and, and again, in a, in a standards-based learning environment, students do have multiple opportunities to practice the same skills or, or the same um, content. And so they will see it again. How will we ensure that that feedback is impactful for the next time they're in that environment? Well, I thank you for your time. Um, there were four books. I only really named one, which is the feedback fix, but many of the studies that I shared, um, the thanks for the feedback is a resource that I use to think about how we receive feedback. And that was, that's was that been a really impactful book um, for, for myself. Mindset, this is where the research for growth-minded, um, supporting students to be growth-minded comes from. And then there's a new book, this is a pretty recent book, but I've just been digging into it in really how we need to challenge ourselves to think again and be willing and be open um, to accept that we don't know everything. And growth-minded individuals are more likely to do that and are more likely to look at feedback as a way to challenge what they thought they knew and how they can improve in the future or how they can even improve their learning. So that's all I have today. Um, again, thank you for those who are here live. Thank you to those of you who spent time to listen to this back. And I think I'll close that unless there are um, any questions or responses that people wanna share. Thank you.